There are many translations of Sumerian tablets in existence um, from various sources. Obviously, one of the most famous um, sources is Zechariah Sitchin, but there are universities around the world that do translations all the time. Other groups, there's also the Shoyan collection, Sumerian tablets, which I used um, extensively in, in uh, Slave Species of God. Uh, there are other translators of Sumerian texts. Um, for example, um, there, is, there was a, a Czech translator in the, in the early 1900s already uh, that was working with those. Um, and uh, across the world, um, there are people that are busy with it all the time. They're not uh, necessarily well known uh, and they don't necessarily publish their findings. Um, so it, it, it remains a, a mysterious area of information. And so whatever you can get a hold of, you know, hold on to it dearly and, and protect that information. Zechariah Sitchin's translations are some of the pivotal key activation um, works that have allowed people to think outside the box to imagine a whole new reality, to imagine a whole new paradigm, an entire different history from what we've been told by pretty much all other um, historians or researchers. And uh, being a scholar of Sumerian texts for his whole life, uh, we can say without any doubt that he was a master translator. But just like every master has his critics, the same was, was, was Zachariah Sitchin. And it's unfortunate, but this is what we have to deal with. Um, you have to look at the body of work, his life's dedication towards this, and uh, that should give us the confidence and the comfort to know that he really knew what he was talking about on a much higher level of deeper connection, understanding, and level of consciousness than other um, possibly newcomers or lesser scholars of that particular art form or translation uh, will have knowledge of and uh, I am forever grateful to Zachariah and his commitment and his contribution to expanding the human knowledge, the consciousness that has put many people like myself onto a path of discovery and we can say that not all his translations are 100% accurate. That's not possible but what it's done is uh, given us a platform of departure and as we go we discover that this interpretation here may have meant something else or that was not necessarily the, the right word but if you replace it with this word suddenly it opens a whole new doorway to understanding what he was already translating and for that we must be eternally grateful. Um, there, there are very clear common denominators in the translations even in the translations of, uh, that you find on the Oxford University website, uh, which I have very little confidence in, by the way, because it comes from a mainstream university and we know that universities are there to hide information and knowledge and not to share information and knowledge. And for people that aren't aware of that yet, this will come to you as you start delving into this, this, this pot of, um, of ancient um, uh, hiding of knowledge and information and that goes back and the manipulation of humankind for thousands of years. Universities are critical role players in this hiding of knowledge and information. But even on Oxford University's website, you read page after page of the Sumerian texts that have been translated by probably um, very um, badly informed or educated translators. And I'm just going out on a whim here. I suspect that many of those translations come from students that are doing the translation work and not from masters of translation. And therefore, it often reads like gibberish. But even in the, those Sumerian texts there, that you talk about the Anuna gods, page after page, Anuna gods, and Enlil, Anu, and Enki. And you read about these Anuna gods that Sitchin calls the Anunnaki, which is quite possible the connection to that in the, in the Bible is the Anakim, as the Anunnaki. There's a very possible relationship there. And these were the gods and the, the, the giants of, of ancient times. Um, so that's the one very important connection. But the other one, without doubt, and any question in my mind, is uh, listening to what Sitchin had to say about um, the Anunnaki and their obsession with gold, that they were mining 
an unimaginable amounts of gold and somewhere there should be evidence of this ancient gold mining. Now he was suggesting that that gold mining activity was taking place in southern Africa and uh, over the last 10 years I have provided the evidence, the physical evidence for this vast gold mining empire at the southern tip of Africa, in South Africa and Zimbabwe predominantly with uncovering the millions of stone circles that they were energy devices, that, they were, that there were millions of gold mines mining unimaginable amounts of gold, that there still are tunnels, underground tunnels, filled with gold today. And this opens up a whole new chapter of information and research that is really exciting. It is like a, a true Indiana Jones experience. Yeah. And I've been fortunate enough to meet a number of scholars around the world uh, two specifically that I can think of immediately in the United States that knew Zachariah Sitchin very well. They spent many years, many decades with him as a scholar and they just have the highest praise for him. His knowledge, his absolute mastery of the Sumerians, the Sumerian texts, the cuneiform texts, the translations. And there is no doubt in their mind that he was what his books claim to be and the knowledge that he shared with us in his books and his translations. And then uh, another thing comes, uh, comes to mind, my uh, impromptu discussion with this uh, a German translator. And by the way, there are many translations of Sumerian texts in German that are not available in English. The Germans are sitting on volumes and volumes of Sumerian texts translated. It's only available in German. I'm trying to lay my hands on some of it. I have subsequently met some German uh, scholars who have studied Sumerian texts and the translations at some of the conferences that I've done in Germany and they also support the work of Sitchin and those translations and the common denominator is that the trans to translate those texts is not simple it's not something you can scan with a computer and get sense out of it that's when you get gibberish and I suspect that's what they're doing at places like Oxford University they, they seem to have scanners with which they scan these tablets and, and it then gives them a rough translation and it doesn't make any sense. It is a very refined art form to study those symbols, their relationship to each other, what one meaning, how one meaning affects the word that follows it and so forth. It's all energetic work, right? All this encoded with the, is, is encoded with deep understanding and, and the translation of energy into meaning. And uh, I had the, the privilege of traveling for about two hours in the car with the German translator. And he is one of the last four remaining master translators of proto-Sanskrit text. And, and that is just a supreme art form. So we had a huge discussion about the subtleties of decoding this, these ancient texts and how difficult it is and complicated it is. How one letter in a word can change the entire meaning, right? Um, and how one word in a sentence can change the entire meaning. And, um, and that just made me realize that any armchair critics that have anything to say about so-called validity of Zachariah Sitchin's translations must remain armchair critics. Go out there and learn this, go through a lifetime of understanding it, and then we can open a debate about what your true understanding is of this lifetime of work.